Okay, let's talk about the novel prediction or prediction of subcellular localization. And on this slide, we already have these three words. Uh, you all <coughs> find an explanation what biohomology means? Well, it's the thing where you have the shape that you put the object of the shape through the shape. This is right in sort of historical sense, but on the level of the protein, when we talk about prediction of subset localization, but homology essentially means by sequence similarity. So you have a protein K for which you know the subset localization or the function, and you have a protein U that is similar to sequence similar to K. And when U and K are sequence similar enough, you say they have a similar subset localization, right? That is by homology. De novo. You're familiar with the word. What does it mean in terms of prediction methods? Do you believe it means? So there are two to give, right? This is you use some evolutionary information, you use some lookup for, in order to make the inference for protein U, you have to find a protein K, but a sequence similar for K, you have to know something about localization or function, okay? Uh, for the other two, it's not like that. And we have two to give, ab initio and de novo. Anybody ventures to guess what the difference is between the two? Like from first principles. That's exactly what it is. Yes, some molecular simulations. So you would have in molecular the idea is you would understand the basic principle of what keeps a protein together, what makes a protein fold. And those basic principles would tell you whether or not that particular protein ends up in a particular subset localization, has a particular function. Arguably, in the field of biology, up initial almost never happens. Up initial First principles is something that happens in physics. So in physics, typically, yeah. physicists would say, I understand if and only if I can do an ab initio modeling. That means I can understand a problem such as the apple falling from the tree from pr first principles. If I don't find a formula like that, I don't understand. That's what the physicist would say. Uh, in biology, there are almost never these examples. So these examples are there on the level of the way the protein binds DNA is done by some electrostatic interaction. Uh, but the folding, we cannot fold a protein from first principles and get to that. All of biology essentially is on this uh, realm here of de novo. De novo means you do it, you do a prediction for your protein U without knowing K. So there are, the typical way of de novo is you have machine learning devices. So the machine learning devices take a bunch of proteins for which you know experimentally what they do, and you sort of extract some pattern in those. Uh, but when you predict the subset localization in this particular case for you, you do not look up a particular other protein. You look at an average feature or something like that. I'm going to show you different ways of doing this uh, in today's lecture. But most of it really is de novo. Uh, the problem is clear. So we have a cell. The prokaryotic cell essentially has the membrane and everything else swims in the cytoplasm in the soup. Well, it's not a soup. It's, it's the density is much higher of a cell. It's, it's more like a watch, as I said. But ultimately, there is no further organization. There is no further detail on where is DNA handled, for instance. Going from the prokaryotes to the eukaryotes, this detail is added. In fact, the difference between these two is the word karyot. Karyot is the core, the Greek word for core. Pro is before the core was invented. Uh, eukaryotes is the ones with a core. Uh, so prokaryotes don't have a nucleus. They do. The nucleus is surrounded by a membrane. DNA, essentially that is where your, well, our genome, the three gigabases of the genome, they sit in there. Uh, and it is protected by a layer of lipids, so in this particular case, in fact, two layers of lipids. There are other particles here that are also protected. Now, there's a slightly different drawing of a uh, nuclear, uh, of a eukaryotic cell. So there's the rough endoplasmic reticulum, there are the ribosomes, there's, there's the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, that's the membrane here, flagellum. This is actually the pro propeller to move, it's not only in bacteria, it's also in eukaryotes. Lysosomes, Golgi complex, and then, and then, and What is the advantage of having a s smaller compartments? Why not keep it like in the prokaryote? 
So you have different reaction environments for different kinds of reactions? That is exactly one of the main reasons, right? You can put, uh, you, since you put a membrane around it, you can slightly change the pH value. By changing the pH value, you can change the way proteins are react. Right? That's, that's one simple mechanism. There's another one. Control goes in and out, like... So you essentially, by keeping everything in a local, keeping certain jobs confined to a certain space, you have more control over the problem, right? You say everything that has to do with the DNA, managing DNA essentially with reading the, the, the genome, happens in the nucleus, all right? So now you can bring all the proteins into the nucleus that have to do with DNA, and this is a sort of more fine-grained control mechanism, and the distances are not that high. Everything that has to do with DNA is here. So the, the probability of reaching your point is also much higher because the compartment is smaller. It's not that you could find the DNA here or here. You don't have to sample the, the cell. In a prokaryotic cell, that's easy to sample the cell because it's much, much smaller than a eukaryotic cell, right? Mind you that just the mitochondria here are of the dimension of a typical bacterium or a, a typical prokaryote. So you see that how, you would have to travel much further, right? Now, we will today mostly think about it in the level of much simpler version of a cell that has a nucleus, that has something swimming around, there may be mitochondria and there's an outside space, the extracellular space. I refer to proteins that are brought into the extracellular space as proteins that are secreted, brought outside. Uh, and then there are some sort of more detailed distinctions. What is important to remember is so the proteins essentially come from the the DNA nucleus, then they exchange with the cytosol, so from, from uh, being born, so to speak, uh, they go to the cytosol, and then there are sort of major traffic pathways. Again, the one between nucleus and cytosol is gated through holes that are where the, con the, the, the in, in and out is controlled through gates, so to speak. I'll get back to that later. Um, and then there are the ones that is sort of transmembrane uh, vesicle or transmembrane transport and vesicular transport. The major pathway that people typically refer to is to secretion. It's not major because most proteins do that, but it's the best understood in some sense. So a protein swimming somewhere in the cell meant for secretion will undergo, will essentially go through all of these compartments. It will go through the ER, the plasmic reticulum, through the Golgi, typically through vesicles, and then get out. Um, so many will go here, uh, some will go directly, but they will essentially all go through these two. So there's a simple, well-defined pathway. Some proteins will be retained here, some will be retained here. Okay, so now if we want to predict subset localization, there are different ways in which we can do that. We can use homology information. We can use motifs. Uh, this is something in between. I'll show you what I mean here. Motifs essentially are sequence similarity, but they are not sequence similarity on the level of the entire protein. This is a local stretch. Okay, uh, we'll talk about that one, and then I will talk about de novo. I will not talk about using structure, but I will essentially talk about sequence based. So the first story here is the homology based inference. We briefly talked about that already last week, or the week before last week. Uh, you essentially, when two proteins are very similar, you have a safe zone in which you can infer that most likely, given the sequence similarity, they will have the same subset localization. Then there's a zone where the signal sort of fades, twilight. Uh, and then there's a zone where the signal is completely gone. As some of you may remember this zoning here from, it was introduced for, the, uh, for protein structure comparisons, uh, but it essentially is, is true for other fields too. The work was done by Rajesh Nair, who's sitting here, is now FDA, at the FDA. Again, you begin by all the set of proteins for which you know the subset localization. This is also what you use for the exercises. Then you get a sequence unique subset, they're out, they're out here, and you compare the sequence unique subset against everything else. You want to infer, this is a Swiss bar record, you want to infer the nuclear localization here, you want to infer that two proteins have a similar localization based on the sequence similarity. Uh, Mind you, again, I guess in the exercise you have been told that, you cannot just parse SwissBot for subset location and find word nuclear and that you're done with, because a lot of the records have 
the additional words by similarity, by sequence similarity, by uh, homology, by inference, and then and, and Only some of those records, in fact, the, the smallest part of all the records that have the field subcellular location, have really experimental annotations. And for using SwiftPort, those are the ones you want. The others essentially are uh, sort of created by something that, that we now want to verify. The simplest measure for sequence identity is percentage pairwise sequence identity, where you essentially count how many identical letters you have aligned. Uh, the, what I show here is the HSSP curve, number of residues aligned versus percentage sequence identity. That's the formula I had just now. This gives another axis, which is how many residues are aligned. The blue curve is the one that distinguishes between everything above it has a similar structure. Below, we can't tell. Uh, and you see now here in this particular slide, red means they have a similar subcellular organization. Green means they don't. And there are some green points here, meaning there are, for very long alignments, 400 residues and more, for very high levels of sequence identity above 90%, you have pairs of proteins that, in fact, are observed in two different compartments. Um, that HSP value is essentially, this is the curve that I showed you. HSP value is the distance to that curve. Above the curve is plus, below the curve is minus. Uh, and I'm going to show you a curve here where we where I look at this uh, HVL, the distance from the curve. The curve is zero. And I, I, you see, sorry, the I, I took out the wrong slide here. Um, you s um, what the data shows, and it's not that easy to see, I admit, is when you look at the HSP line of zero or slightly there above, then what you see, five different lines for chloroplast, mitochondria, extracellular, nuclear, and cytoplasmic. As long as you are somewhere clearly above this zero point here, these, all these five curves are high, whatever you call high. Uh, you can pick a point where they are higher than 80%, right? Easily. So maybe that point is somewhere here and you will be above 80% if you have an HSSP distance of 20 and higher. So this is 0, 5, 10, this is 20 here. When every pair that is above that line has over 80% accuracy in inferring subcellular localization. That means that you find or have a protein U for which you don't know the subcellular localization, and at that given HSSP threshold, you find another protein in a database of known localizations, you simply say that U has the same as K. And 80% of the cases, you'll be right. You can also use this to, in fact, give a probability of how right you will be. You simply take the value, transfer it to a probability, and then, depending on the HSP value, you will get that. Another way of Measuring sequence identity, so percentage sequence identity, HVAL uses percentage sequence identity but ignores short bits, so to speak. Uh, so the one thing in this curve that I did not point out, um, but you, you see it, uh, I don't see it actually, I'm sorry. But the, the curve hits, if you have 11 identical residues, you cannot tell anything about structure. 11 is not enough. And the same is certainly true for function, in fact, since I looked at plus 20, uh, yes. Yeah, so in this curve, the, the, the red point, yes. so the that green points say that if we have two proteins that are like each other, we find them in different uh, localizations, right? So the, all the green points are pairs of proteins at a certain level of, of, of length, 200 residues. You have for this green point uh, 25 or whatever the number is, percent of sequence identity, mm -hmm. and they are green because they are found experimentally in two different subset of proteins. Yes. Now, what is to say that these proteins, being similar, appear in both of these localizations? Could be. Could so be. Uh, so we are looking at a data set of uh, proteins for which we have only one uh, subset localization annotated experimentally, and it could be that one is missing. So some of them may be errors. Yes. We will maybe get back to that issue. Um, what else could we, how else could we measure sequence? Similarity. How can we compare sequences? So PID is the simplest percentage sequence identity. This is just the simplest plus sort of length, meaning short things you value different from long alignments. That's all it does. 
uh, sounds complicated. So, so, like, uh, so counting all the charge residues, that would be uh, that would be in some sense too clever. Uh, too clever in the sense that it requires a lot of biophysical insight already, right? <coughs> so these, this uh, requires some biologic insight. Essentially the insight is when you have 90% uh, sequence identity for something that is five residues, it may be meaningless. If you have it for 500 residues, it's meaningful. That is an insight, but it's a fairly trivial one, right? Uh, PID is really zero insight. It's just the simplest thing you can count. Alphabetic or edit distance or whatever you count that is the simplest way to compare two strings. Uh, what you say would be something that is relevant for certain purposes. So in particular, if I want to ask whether two proteins bind similarly to DNA, the charge residues would be extremely important for that. To answer that question, positively charged residues, and we will see other examples today where positively charged residues yeah, is important. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. something more generic. Please. Yeah. Would it be too much of a bother to adjust the microphone so that we can see the light clearly? Because we're right by. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much, Benjamin. Um, you now see it, or, or you still don't? Uh, because when it, when it like turns, then maybe we will see when it blinks, but. Uh, if I, uh, yeah, this is okay. Thank you very much for that. The question remains: Do you, Are you aware of any any other way to measure sequence identity or see want, similarity? Do we want to measure pairwise? Yeah. Because wouldn't it be better? To yes. Answer? But there's sim uh, true. It would be better to have a measure that is sort of family specific. But most likely, we begin with pairs first and then adopt that measure to to families. And in fact, all of these measures we can, well, in particular the one that comes next, we can easily, is the one that is typically also used for multiple alignments. Um, it's a very trivial one. You guys have heard it in your in bioinformatic introduction lecture. Most of you. No? Is there something called Wittgenstein distance? Yeah, uh, that, that would still be fairly similar to an edit distance. That would still be similar to a PIDE. Uh, so what I simply mean is the uh, the E value, and that comes from the idea that when you have a score, whatever the score is, it's a smith waterman score, it's PIDE, whatever you measure the similarity between two two sequences gives you a score. <laughs> then there is a random hit probability. If you have something, you hit the database. That's the database background. And ultimately, how relevant the score is depends on how far away from the red the blue is, the blue distribution. And the simplest way to measure that is you look at the average. So the, the simplest, if I assume that the background is relatively a Gaussian, then I can describe the Gaussian by its average and its standard deviation. So in that model, all I need is the standard deviation, the average, I can compile an expectation value that essentially establishes how likely did that score happen a chance. Okay, so E values 10 minus 100 means that the probability that this happened is 10 minus 100, that this happened by chance is 10 minus 100. Now, you could now argue 10 minus 100 is such a small number, or let's take another one, 10 minus 10 is also a very, very small number, right? Uh, and you would argue that 10 minus 10 is, is absolutely safe. But today's database, uh, Uniprot, is, 80, or is, a, is about 100 million sequences. 100 million is 10 by the 10. Okay? So at 10 minus 10 in this database, at least if everything would be statistical, it's not quite that in the bio sequence world, but if everybody, everything would be completely statistical, I would find one hit, even at a level of 10 minus 10, right? That is spurious, that is random, is chance, okay? So even 10 minus 10 in very large databases begins to be not good enough. And that is the level where, you're totally right, Anton, uh, that's the level where we look at family information, but the score of E value is then compiled for the entire family. Right? Essentially this is the way profile scores are compiled. Uh, that's the E value and then now I briefly, I already showed you this story, say I want to infer that this is a method transfer race, then I'm going to look at accuracy, so I put some threshold somewhere and I say everything that is blue above is right, that is count accuracy and then there's coverage, so how many of the blue ones did I discover at that threshold? So that threshold here I have two and three right, 
uh, and two and four I found of the blue ones. At that threshold, I have fewer right ones. The percentage of right drops, not fewer. The percentage of right drops, uh, but the percentage of the ones I find, of the blue ones I find, incre increases. So I have all blue ones found at that threshold a 3 in 8 uh, accuracy. So this ultimately is the story about true positives, false negatives, false positives, true negatives, and with this we can compile a bunch of scores. All of that is sort of trivial, uh, look uh, in Wikipedia. Now I'm going to show BLAST pairwise, uh, multiple sequence alignments for percentage sequence identity, E value and the H value, and that is essentially how well a subset of organization in five classes conserved under different values. Okay, um, now this one clearly shows uh, that Psi Blast, in fact, is better than Blast, and that uh, the E value is the best way of measuring it. Did you see that? There's a bunch of curves, there's a lot of over overload. And mind you that in the, in the exercise, in the exam, I will ask uh, what the fifth curve here, the value for the fifth curve. Remember every single point in that. Don't, don't worry. Uh, this is an overload. The point that I want to make here is, this is the kind of information that if you present that in your thesis, Yes, if you sit in front of that and you pick your fingers, oh, this point is the one I'm going to look at the level of accuracy of 70 and then I look at this value and then I find individual points and then I say this is higher than that. But it's absolutely not easy for the group, the audience, to see this. This is not the kind of thing, in most talks, this is the kind of thing, as I have shown 15 slides ago, this is apparent. It's not at all. So when people show you these things, at least you cannot jump up in these talks. But at least for yourself, realize you don't know. It may not be interesting, but put a question mark in at least. Maybe you look it up at home. Maybe it's not relevant. Uh, or ask, ask the professor. In this particular case, this is not the way to compare them. The way, in fact, how would we compare them? Accuracy covers versus threshold curves. How would we do this? Again, I said that if I gave you enough time and you picked a lot of points, you could get there. But this is certainly not easy for me to convince you that this is better than this. Or that this, in fact, would be the next point is better than this. So using the HSSP curve is better than using the E value. Uh, those are statements that if I gave you the rest of the day, you could possibly see in those slides, uh, in this one slide. Uh, but what would be a much simpler way of showing that? Well, the first simplest thing that you should do is you should superpose them, right? You should have the same curve on the same uh, graph. And for the same graph, in fact, the axis can no longer be, be PID or, or threshold, because they differ in their thresholds. So you have to have something that relates to either accuracy or coverage, or something like that. This is one way of doing it. Uh, here is one way of doing it, uh, that is where at least three different things are superposed. Uh, I'm still standing here, I'm still staying on, on HSP distance versus uh, E-value. Uh, and I have uh, two different curves that I want to point out. The green is to what extent are proteins having a similar structure. The, the HSP curve has been optimized to make this green one, f to fit to the green one. That's why the green is steep. That's why the, the green one works best on the zero here. <coughs> but you see that somehow the blue, which is subset localization, is also reflected in the green ones. Mind you, this is uh, most likely three classes of subset localization. So there's some random number here that is close to, to 33%. So this is somewhere random here. Uh, but you do see two things already. One is that the E value never reaches the same height. The blue in the E value never gets above 90%. While for the HSP value, statistically, you can find some pairs for which you reach 90%. What you don't see here is what the coverage is. It could be that in these curves, this is one pair. 
or two or three, a very, 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 very tiny number, right? That we don't see. We don't see the corresponding points. Uh, but at least you in this, in this curve already immediately see something that is better in this one than that. And we would have to look at the coverage in order to see more. Um, so this is what I said, we only compare accuracy here. Uh, so here we, we sort of see a more complex way of doing it. We have coverage and accuracy and we have two curves. So, but that, you, as you immediately see, is complicated. So we have an axis for coverage, we have an axis for accuracy, and essentially we gray lines are coverage, the uh, black lines are accuracy, and then again, you can sort of find corresponding points. So you, now you look at the curve that is symbolized by the black triangles, you pick a point in the gray, gray is coverage, black triangle would be accuracy, and then you pick the points and you look at the an an analogous situation. But again, that doesn't work because we really have to impose them. Uh, we have to find something like an accuracy coverage curve in some sense, and that would be this one here. Now, the gray ones are pair. I'm sorry for the, for the quality, but you can at least see the gray. And the corresponding ones always use the same symbol. So compare the gray and the open circles, and the black open circles. And you see, again, this is cumulative accuracy versus cumulative coverage, so you're better if you're higher. And you can always see that the black is higher than the gray. So the corresponding black curve, essentially mostly. So sometimes they intersect like this one here. So this is the point that you made, Anton. It wouldn't work better if I had a family. Black is the family, gray is the pair. Okay? But using different measures, and each one of these three measures here is used again for now the family. Um, now the next issue is, is the PID, E value or H value? What, what, what is the best of those? Uh, so the dark ones are best and of the dark ones, for most of the region at least, the HSP distance here is clearly above the E value. Right? There is a uh, switch over here. Uh, so when the accuracy falls below some value, when you get more into the sort of background signal, then the E value does much better. Okay? But on this one you see this all clearly. Again, this is complex. I'm, I'm showing you six different curves here on one slide. But on this one slide, you can immediately have the clear conclusion that black is higher than gray. And when I look at the black or when I look at the gray, the circle ones are, tend to be, for most of the RAM here, tend to be the highest. Okay, so now the question is, now I have a method, I know that I can use homology to infer subcellular localization. I call that a method, because I establish at what level of sequence similarity, and I use the HVL to measure sequence similarity, can I infer at what accuracy what probability, so to speak, subset localization. Okay, you've done that. Now, would that be the end of your paper? So you could publish a paper like that. In fact, we did. So the answer could be done. Um, what else could you do? Now that you establish this measure. Previous findings and be evaluated. Oh, that's very oh, that's essentially. Oh, well, that's, yeah, the, ah, the, the, that's an interesting idea, Benjamin, but this gets this. The problem is this is a social problem. So, what you will most likely do is you will find five different people who actually support you because they work in the same field, mm -hmm. who want you to do something new because they are also in the field, and you will tell them they're all wrong. And this is not likely to be to, to make reviewers happy. Not really Let's just say, um, what's the word? There's no way of... Ref Previous findings? Yeah, enhance. You are wrong, you are wrong, you are wrong, and I have enhanced your finding now. Uh, because I can show you how wrong you are. Not going to cut it uh, for many reviewers. Some reviewers may be happy, but... Uh, so, I mean something else. I mean something that is a line, is along the line of what you said. Uh, apply it to something. What could you apply it to? Well, you could uh, simply apply it to asking how many proteins in human can I annotate with this? I have my database SwissProt, for which I know the experimental subcellular localization, and I can simply ask, okay, here are my thresholds. I want to 
I define my threshold. I say I want to reach an accuracy for annotating human proteins, the subset localization of human proteins, at at least 80% or whatever I pick. How many do I annotate? Right? And you can then play that for different organisms. And what I, what I show here, uh, the organisms being human, and it's an old slide, Arabidopsis, C. elegans, Drosophila, and yeast, uh, up there, the then assumed to be numbers of proteins, and you already see uh, this is not compatible with what we believe today. We believe that people have about 20,000 uh, proteins, not 31. Oh, 3,100. Okay, this is a subset, this is one chromosome. Uh, it was not complete. Um, but anyway, so these are old numbers. Anyway, this is what symbolized the entire sequence set that we had at the time. And the colors in green means you have experimental data. In blue, that is covering what I just showed you. White is unknown. This down here is a zoom in. This is uh, 0 to 100 percent. This is just uh, topped at 40 percent. That's why it moves up. You don't really see how much. Th so the first thing, the important thing, uh, is that those days, essentially, this comparative uh, homology-based inference worked because the blue is higher than the green. But it did not fill up the pie. I will talk about this one in a minute. So ultimately, uh, this is using keywords, and that's the ne next technique here, text similarity. And that again is a work uh, from Rajesh. Uh, so he argued, well, listen, if I see that record, and if the annotation location would not be in this one, because the annotator has not found that in the paper, or the annotator had forgotten to put it in to this record, seeing that this is a transcription activator, as a biologist, I actually know this is a DNA binding protein. A DNA binding protein is nuclear. So from this information here, I could infer that it's nuclear, even if the nuclear localization would not be annotated. Okay? Um, now, there are sort of things. Excuse me. Yeah? Is it, is it really true? Like for, for RNA, we know, all right, so it might be everywhere else. And this is not always the case, but in this particular case. Isn't, isn't there also extra uh, nuclear uh, DNA molecules in the sense of epigenetics, yada, yada, yada? Very few. So in a statistical sense, no. All oh, right. Essentially, again, on the, on the level, so if we would talk about physics, where you get something right to the six digits or something like that, mm -hmm. biology, where you get the right something, you're happy if you get 90%, so 10% error, way, way, way less than that. Okay. It's a total exception. Uh, I assume, I'm, I'm not entirely sure about the number, but I assume that the tenth of the human proteins, yeah, roughly a tenth of the proteins oh. bind DNA, and most likely five of those, or I don't know, ten, are, are not nuclear. Uh, so f 10, 10 of 2,000, so uh, 20, uh, is a tiny number. Um, again, so the goal of that method then would be to find what biologists would call simple correlations, that DNA binding means nuclear, that chromatin regulator means nuclear, blood correlation means extracellular. It's essentially trivial. It's not trivial for the machine. It's trivial for a biologist who knows the background, but n for a computer, this is not trivial at all. And the second goal is to find non-obvious relations, right? We begin with a data set from Swissport, where for, in this particular case, five subset localizations, we have these localizations, we have the keywords, we extract for 15,000 proteins the keywords, uh, and have a, a keyword database that ultimately is exactly these words, right? We, we, we try to take the black to predict the blue. So we remove, we, 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 we try to remove the blue. We have the blue for the 15,000. How would you do it? In a simple way. Invent a simple method that does it. So in this particular case, you can actually clearly do it without machine learning. Uh, but what's the first step? So this clearly is the input, right? Somehow. So you will use the words. What would be your first step? Just look at the words. Maybe some some ideas immediately pop to your head. Hash then. That means what? Well, geo. For instance, we could use. Uh, I don't know if this, these are geo terms. But nope. Histogram the words. Histogram the words, and that brings us to the first very very important issue. Uh, so some words that of uh, are blah 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 blah. 
you can throw it out because it's simply the definition of throwing it out, it will happen in all five subset organizations. Right? Or whatever your definition is, it could also be that your definition is you throw out anything that happens in three. Because you want words that are specific, at least in combination, for one subset organization. Uh, if they're not, they're not good. So now the histogram of the remainder would help you to simply see what is, so then you have to have a histogram that is specific to the classes and you have the most informative classes. Okay? In our case, those most informative classes ended up being something that I remember to be in the ballpark of 400. Now we have, in fact, these are the keywords here this four, that runs to 400. These in the rows are the proteins and every single protein now is characterized by a binary number, a binary vector that has zeros and ones. Zero if that keyword in the column is in that record. It's not in that record. One if the keyword is in that record, right? Once? No, no matter how often. No matter how often. So the simplest thing is a binary vector that simply has it once. Um, because ultimately, again, l looking at this uh, as transcription activator, the transcription activator, if that were a keyword, it doesn't matter how often it's written in that record. It's, it, it is important that it's a transcription activator. It is important that it's binding DNA. Uh, whether that's written five times is not really relevant. Uh, uh, that was the logic behind it. Okay, so. Now my question to you is, how can you use this slide to get an idea what the next step of the method would be? We can apply this for data um, where we already know the optimization. See um, for which vectors we can correlate a certain mm -hmm. and then use this. And then use how? Yeah, yeah, so far so good, but use how? Then You're totally right. Yeah, maybe I know that for the first one, I know it's in nucleus. Mm -hmm. um, when it has uh, zero, one, one, zero, mm -hmm. and so on, and then I can use see the same vector. It's maybe also up here. Mm -hmm. So essentially, I build the experimental vector database, and I have a query, and the query matches the experimental database. And I know. What if it doesn't match? What if? This, this apoptosis is not written. Everything else is there. But the word apoptosis is missing because people haven't written it or haven't done the experiment. So then I cannot match the vector at all, or what? Yeah, we need a threshold, right? You could do that. You could say, well, I need at least five keywords, but the five keywords still would be the vector that will not be identical. Maybe as similar as possible. As similar as possible. Uh, and the way Rajesh designed this uh, is through the idea, as similar as possible, he uh, did it in, a, in an edit distance kind of way. He did not say, I'm going to measure the similarity necessarily, but I'm going to create subvectors. And the subvectors, either of those have to match. The subvectors essentially are the ones where I turn the zeros, uh, the ones into zeros. Every single uh, one is turned into zero, absence of keywords essentially absence of data, right? Uh, and then I have the, the large data set of the original vectors plus the subvectors. So if the keyword would be missing in that, in that vector, that span my database, uh, my experimental database. And then I simply have to match the two vectors and the match function could be whatever you take. In this particular case, this sort of sequence similarity measure in some sense, it's not sequence, the vector similarity is, is just the Shannon information. P log P. Uh, you could do it in a, another way, in any other way. He didn't have a class where he said, I cannot match this at all. Like, this is unknown. This will happen then. So uh, now, so far, what we have done is we have sort of done exactly what um, I have to begin to learn, to learn your names and uh, what Pia, right? Uh, what Pia said is she, we, we have built the data set and we have matched it into, we are trying to match it to the data set. Now, depending on what, bless you, uh, depending on the size of this Shannon information, you may now decide I cannot match it to any. So far, this decision has not been made, right? And now you, there are actually two different ways in which you can do that. You can say, well, my information is not enough to match it to any. Or you can say, again, what you said before, Anton, uh, the number of keywords that you have to match at least. So you have to have, a, if you have only one keyword, it's not enough, or two, or something, right? Uh, and that essentially is the idea here, the query subvector against the database matching. Uh, and then you get 
These are keywords that are used here for cytoplasmic, extracellular, mitochondrial, nuclear. And some of those are, are trivial, some of them are not. Uh, correlations formed by mistakes, well, let's not get into that. Uh, and then you get sort of number of keywords, so the more keywords, uh, essentially you believe you, are, you, you do better, but unfortunately for most proteins you see the number of keywords that you have that are relevant are sort of just a few. So ballpark, <laughs> ballpark five. Um, and here we show the number of keywords in, in coverage, so of the ones that you want to find, how many do you find? Uh, blue accuracy of the ones you found at that threshold, how many are right? So, say, you require that at least um, thirty percent. There's some mistake here. The, the, the coverage should be the other way around. Um, so you require that you have at least thirty keywords. Then you see that the accuracy here, the blue, is fairly high. If you sort of make decisions on fewer keywords, then the accuracy sort of decreases. And here, I guess we, what we have is some sort of noise situation. The coverage. Uh, there's something wrong with the coverage. It must be one minus the coverage. Um, now, the second best hit, and that is essentially what you briefly do in your, uh, one of the things you do in your exercise, um, is not give the curve that I showed you before, accuracy versus coverage, top hit, but so this top hit, I can't remember what his decision was. We need at least five keywords. And for all of the, those where we did, don't have the five keywords, there's no decision or there's a random decision. And for everything else, you show the blue curve. Okay? Uh, <coughs> now, instead, the red curve shows what, if I ask, is the first or second. So you have one that matches best to this vector and you have one that matches second best. What if I did not only consider the best, but also the second best? Okay? So then I can say one of those two is right. And that is the red curve. What you can see is that the red curve is above the blue. So using, instead of the first hit, the first two, strong, two strongest hits, improves performance. Is that right? So is the second hit the way to go? Okay, we have five states, right? So mind you, the, the random, if instead of giving one in five, I give two in five, my random hit increases by 20%, or should increase by 20%. If let me play this further here. If I showed you the green curve where I have 5 and 5, then that's flat 100. And flat 100 is clearly higher than any of these lines. It's still total nonsense. So the question is here, is red nonsense or actually good, right? And what you see is that the red is clearly not 20% better. So just that's one thing you see. The other thing that you see is that the first one is clearly better than 20%. So on the first hit, you're clearly outperforming random by far. You're not getting 20% accuracy. There's cases where you, for, for, for some 25% of the cases here, you get over 80% accuracy. This is way, way, way higher than the random 20, right? But what you add here, in this particular case, okay, you add 25 plus maybe 10%, but not 20. So the second one, while the system performs very well for the top hit, it performs almost random, or worse than random, for the second hit. So this method is really geared towards finding the best hit. Okay? And bringing in the second hit here really appears to not really make sense. Okay, and ultimately this is what you have to address in your exercises. Is there enough information for a second hit in subcellular localization? Is it true that we have to look at the second subcellular localization because proteins are travelers? Or is it the random phenomenon that I simply give two in three states and have a higher number simply because I have a higher random 
hit, right? This is what you, for predicting two different subset localizations, have to distinguish. Do is how much information is contained in the second one? And most likely, the second state for the experimental annotation of subset localization, most likely the second state is less accurate, it's even the annotation, than the first. If, if people in experimentalists get to choose what is my strongest, my strongest statement, my strongest experimental signal, that's the first, and that's always better, right? The question is, is the second one still good enough to be informative to train prediction methods? Okay? Or to benefit prediction methods. Uh, the numbers are slightly different for different classes. There are tricky correlations that the system finds. Uh, and we can apply this again in the same sense that I showed you before to different uh, organisms. Uh, here is the application to SwissBot, uh, for which you see that this is the fraction in SwissBot, so 10% roundabout was the fraction at the time, so this is 2002, 17 years, uh, 15 years ago, uh, so about 10% of SwissBot had experimental annotation about subset localization. I'm not sure how much more it is today, uh, maybe even few less, I don't know. This is the part that I showed you, homology-based inference, the blue, and this is the part where you can look, do the localization through localization through the, through the keyword. So you see this is a substantial part. Because, in fact, very often the annotation, there is a lot of functional knowledge. You also mentioned Go numbers, or somebody in the room mentioned Go numbers. Uh, so there are numbers, uh, Benjamin maybe may have been the one. Uh, so there, there, there's a lot of annotation without the explicit statement subcellular sub location is, right? And that's the reason why the blue the red is much higher than the, the green. Anyway, so the, the methods help, help very much for SwitchBot. There still was sort of a, a remainder in SwitchBot. And that remainder, again, the all testing done, again, here's the thing for, for different organisms. And you saw that the red proportionally helped more for yeast than it helped for uh, Arabidopsis or uh, C. elegans. But whatever, it helped everywhere. And in some cases, the blue is higher. In some cases, the green is relatively high. So the ratios are different. Uh, but you can now do it for the whole thing. So now let's get into motifs. Uh, there are two different types of motifs. One type of motif is the one that you can see on the sequence. Here the red one, the protein is on the sequence, you see the motif, you follow the structure, you see the motif, no difference. The second is a conformational motif, so you have two units here that are not on the sequence alone showing it's a motif, but when they are folded, they come together and then they form a motif, right? That is conformational. You have to see the three-dimensional structure before you can identify the motif. Uh, the way you find motifs essentially is you do an alignment. You see, in this particular case, there are four conserved columns in this alignment. And you ask, do you find these four conserved columns in a protein that is very different in sequence? If so, you say that protein has a similar motif. The difference between a motif and the sequence similarity simply is motifs are shorter or more isolated. Sequence similarity is typically measured of an entire protein, or some domain or some, some long fragment, while here what you look at is isolated residues. Enzymatic activity often is a histidine triad, three histidines. They are spaced in sequence. Uh, so you have them at, at positions, again, that is the histine triad, enzymatic activity is a, a conformational motif. So they have to come, those come together in 3D. And then you see this, the three histidines form a, a site that can bind. Now, again, there, there's the trafficking in the cell that I showed you before. Uh, and in this trafficking in the cell, so the first part where we can clearly find these motifs is for the secretory pathway. So for proteins that get out of the cell. And that is called the signal peptide. The idea goes back to Gunnar van Heine, uh, who is one, big, one of the big stars in the field. Uh, this is fully outdated. Um, I should uh, update this. Uh, he, he, this is just one of the many things he has coined. Uh, here you see him as the chair of the Nobel Prize Committee announcing the Nobel Prize in 2008. Gives another idea that he's very influential in 
science, uh, experimental and computational biologist. Um, and so the papers with the, which he sort of worked on uh, signal peptides is going back to the 80s here. And they all aimed at this idea that you find motifs or signals that have to do with the way a protein is transported out of the cell, the so-called signal peptide. Uh, so Brunak, another player in this, uh, a big player in systems biology, uh, one of the biggest people in, in sort of applying machine learning to biology, um, is the part who brings the machine learning into the game. And Henrik Nielsen here is the third in the team who really collected the data. Gunnar's idea, Henrik's data collection and, and CERN's ability to machine learn brought this method signal P or signal peptide prediction. And it began really by describing, uh, by collecting a lot of data, signal peptides, and sort of describing some grammar. Grammar means there is an N-terminal region, so the beginning of the protein. Uh, then there is an H region, that is a region that has a lot of hydrophobic residues. There's a C region that has a lot of polar and uncharged residues. And then there's a site that is cleaved. The cleavage site itself, you can learn by these motifs. So there are particular residues that occur at these cleavage sites. The signal peptides are slightly different between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And you can learn these motifs through neural networks uh, and then later through HMM and different tools. There are tons of refinements of these methods and there are many, 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 many people who copied this because by now I believe this paper is quoted over 5,000 times. Um, so many people tried to somehow get a little bit of the cake. I don't know how many, people, uh, how many methods there are, but ultimately still the, the dominant method is this original one, the signal peptide method. And again, the idea is you identify a signal peptide through a machine learning device because it has a, a certain sequence, signature, right? And the signal, sequence signatures are slightly different for prokaryotes, different types of prokaryotes, uh, gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria have slightly different signal peptides, uh, eukaryotes yet different ones, but they all are common in that the signal peptide is a region that is sort of 50 residues at the beginning of the protein. Okay? And they have a hydrophobic region, so they look a little bit like membrane helices. That is why signal peptides are confused with membrane predictions um, by most methods. And then there are many signal peptides are cleaved. Cleaved means they're cut, right? So I'm telling you that you have a protein of 150 residues and 50 residues are cut off. Is that true? So the one third of the protein is produced just to be cut. Is that right? It must be a really small protein. 150 proteins, 150, so an average domain is 100 residues long. So about 20% of all the proteins are, are single domain. They are about 100 residues long. So 20%, one fifth in human, 4,000 proteins. This is not the majority, but 4,020 is not a small number. Well, then again, I would argue that the, the address space is quite large. So the what? The address space. So if you, if you say that uh, a signal peptide is kind of like the, the, the you know, the baggage claim yes. thingy, yeah. right? But, but you have like a gazillion of locations that you can go to, so you probably need a large... Mm, don't really have peptide. gazillions, right? Yeah, but ish. No. <laughs> it depends on what it will become of, right? Makes a difference. Uh, in this particular case, it is cleaved upon secretion. So there are, so uh, out of the cell. So secretion means out, so you put out of the cell. Uh, again, I can't quite remember at this point how many proteins are secreted, but ballpark 10% of all the proteins are secreted, no, a little less. So uh, it's, not like it's, it's, not, it's only out of the cell, not necessarily to the different like, compartment of the cell. So essentially the secret peptide is getting to the secretory pathway and that ultimately leads to secretion. Some proteins are maintained in the, so some proteins that have a signal peptide are staying in the ER, in the endoplasmic reticulum, some in the Golgi, because they have so-called retention signals that make them keep, stay there, okay? But essentially all the others go on and are secreted. Maybe. And upon secretion, they're cut. 
Well, maybe so, the, 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 the cleaved part is maybe necessary for the transport process. Yes, it is. So 50, uh, one third of, of, of all your bioenergy goes into transport. You believe this is lucky? Indeed, it really is true. That's exactly what it is. Uh, for me, this was very surprising. In fact, it is also true, my, my example is not, you're right, not all proteins are that short, but in fact, the sec secreted proteins are on average much shorter. So for the secreted, secreted proteins, the, the signal peptide is relatively longer in, in that sense. So it's more in the sense that really is a substantial part of the, uh, creating the protein. That's a substantial part uh, of energy. But it is, you call, could call wasted, or it, you could argue, well, for directing the traffic right and for making sure that this protein really gets out, this is a worthwhile investment. Anyway, it's a big investment, and that is the way it happens. It's true. Um, and as I said already, uh, signal peptides are the major problem for, for membrane predictions. Uh, let's not get to, in, in the detail of this slide, essentially what it says is that many membrane prediction methods make big mistakes in predicting signal peptides. They call them membrane proteins. Uh, there are other signals like that. Since this is biology, they of course have different names. Uh, sort of the same thing, but different names. There is what I said, secretion is the signal peptide. There's transit peptides. That is essentially the same thing to get into the chloroplast for plants. And there's uh, targeting peptides, the same thing to get in my, into mitochondria. It's not the same thing. So these methods have different names because, in fact, in detail, the grammars are different. Uh, so the types of residues you observe are different, the, lo the length is different, the sites look different, but they are all have in common that they're N-terminal, they're at the beginning of the protein, and that there is something that a machine learning device can learn about them. So they are relatively simple. Let's call them like that, right? Um, so at this point, uh, I briefly mentioned uh, re retention signals. So I said there are signals that make proteins retained in the endoplasmic reticulum Golgi uh, apparatus. Uh, and here are some of them. Uh, they are on the other end, the end of the protein, the C-terminus. Uh, and they perform all very poorly. So they are still not very well understood. They are supposed to be conformational. We still don't have a lot of evidence for this. It's not a single case where you really can, can prove that it's conformational. Uh, so this is still, there's still a lot of work to be going on. Let's talk about a different issue, lo nuclear localization signals. Uh, and again, those largely are sequential, but we have examples for conformational motifs there as well. Uh, the way it happens is there is this nuclear localization signal that is recognized by proteins such as importing or transporting that take bind to this nuclear localization signal, relatively short, I'll show you a few in a minute, put through the pore in the, in the nuclear double membrane and into the nucleus. When we started this uh, 17 years ago, uh, we looked at the set of all the known localization signals in, in SwissProt, uh, ProSide, that was one. So fairly limited. Uh, it matched in 96 proteins in 31 families, and the accuracy was 90%, meaning the 10% of the proteins it matched were not nuclear, which could again be that it was not observed that they are nuclear. They may really have been nuclear proteins, or maybe that the signal was just not good enough. Okay, it matches only 96 proteins, but this is not good enough. So what we essentially did is we read the literature uh, and collected signals. Red. The red coloring, red font, means that it's a positively KOR, positively charged residue. Um, and those are just some of the signals we found in the literature. You see that KOR is 2 in 20, so 10%. You see more than 10% than red that you immediately see. You also see that there is, so there's dominance of red, more than expected. Uh, and the red you see at different places. And you see that the signals we have here have very different lengths. Right? So there's a great variety, and in fact here the variety goes even further. Uh, there's an immense variety of these nuclearization signals. So this means we cannot apply machine learning. 
at least to us. We, we, we tried all kinds of tools of, of Kamer subsets, uh, none, none of that motif finding and that none of what we tried then at the time, and we did it five years later too, none of that worked. So too complex. But what we did do instead is we did something that we called in, in silico mutagenesis. So we have our data set in yellow of proteins that we know are not nuclear. In green we have the data set of proteins that we know are nuclear and we group them into families and now we ask of a motif that we find in the literature does it only map to nuclear proteins? If not, we have to make it more specific meaning we cut it or we make it longer or we make it some... We, 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 sorry, not cut it uh, if, if it matches to proteins that are not nuclear we have to make it longer uh, and we refine the motif such that it matches only nuclear proteins. Another thing that we're trying to do is make motifs selective enough or covering entire families. So if I match only one nuclear protein, only one family, then I essentially I'm back to sequence identity. It's not a motif. A motif by definition is something that if I group a family by sequence identity I cannot recognize that they are similar. So a motif should be, so this is family one here and this is family two. A motif should span these two. Well, the sequence identity cannot do, or sequence similarity, or uh, easy values, psi plus values cannot do that. That's what I expect of a motif. So we're trying to also make it wide enough so it covers at least two families. And we do several iterations through this engine here and end up with 214 motifs that cover 1300 proteins and by design they are 100% accurate and at the time covered 43% of all the nuclear proteins uh, so we have just uh, submitted a paper just the paper was accepted that sort of redid this after 17 years um, and this number is no longer anywhere near 100% now because the world has changed uh, but we essentially applied the same sort of logic to do more of this. Um, then we do it to genomes, we find things that are very unannotated and interesting and we see that sometimes we actually, the nuclear localization signal is the one that binds DNA. And that's a neat mechanism. What you see is you have the nuclear localization signal that the importing binds to, shuttles into the protein, into the nucleus. Once in the nucleus, the importing goes off. The nuclear localization signal is free and is taken to bind DNA, exactly there, right? Because that's what the protein does in the nucleus, it binds DNA. Then after the DNA goes off, there's another protein, the export, export protein, uh, so that takes it out again and binds to the same nuclear localization signal and gets shuttles it out. And you have a cycle. And you always use the same motif for binding DNA, binding the protein, so it makes a lot of sense. Uh, there are many examples like this. But it's the, the, the most nuclear localization signals are not known to bind DNA. So this is a perfect cycle, and it is used in biology, but this is rel relatively exceptional, only for some proteins, okay? For some motifs. Uh, okay, then again, we can use this to, bind, to predict DNA binding, and we can use this, we can apply this. Uh, that's what I already showed you before. Oh no, it's not the key. Uh, it's not even here. Okay. Uh, but now for whatever remains, so the idea is that there are these exactly, uh, the way Benjamin said that, there are these zip codes, there are these tags, the baggage tags, uh, as he called them, and that in fact is the first Nobel Prize here to get their Blobel from Rockefeller University for essentially postulating this shuttle mechanism through zip codes. Günter Blobel was the first Nobel Prize uh, two years ago. There were three other Nobel Prizes on sort of the same, uh, same topic, but more detailed uh, steering of, of uh, proteins. Reality is, most of these zip codes are not known. Okay? Today. Now, maybe this is because many signals remain to be discovered. Or maybe that many of these zip codes are not the type of simple signals, they are not the type of sequential signals, but they are conformational signals, right? Maybe that's why we didn't discover them, because for most proteins we still don't know the structure. And once we have the structure, we typically don't use it to discover these signals, uh, because then there are other, other things people do with them. And possibly there are other mechanisms. What other mechanism could you imagine? So that the zip code is true, but still not all proteins would use the zip code 
Can you imagine a mechanism by which so the global idea would still be true and still many proteins would not have this zip code? Maybe the zip code is formed by a multimer of proteins. You're close to what I meant. Uh, so imagine this is the, the protein with the zip code. That's the shuttle protein, right? And this protein with the zip code binds another protein. Let's call it a second cargo. You call that a multimeric protein. So it's a, it's a generic protein-protein interaction, right? You have essentially something that is bound to the protein with the zip code. So it could be that most proteins, in fact, are shuttled like this. Meaning that most proteins don't have the zip code directly, but they bind, they piggyback on something that does have a zip code, right? And since proteins specifically bind to other proteins, that could really be the case. Um, in order to see whether it could be the case, we would have to sort of find all the second cargo. Right? We would have to find all the proteins for which we know the zip codes, find all the binding partners, and then see how much would that explain. Uh, and maybe this is, today maybe is sort of the time where we could do an exercise like that. Uh, we could possibly at least estimate the numbers. Maybe we cannot really find it, but we can possibly give, a, give an idea how much that would explain and how much even that would then left, leave un, unexplained. Um, anyway, while we haven't done this, so nobody really has done that, uh, because so far it was a possibility we didn't know enough of the protein, protein interactions. Maybe we know now enough to dare. Maybe in, a, in the next year's course we should begin this. Uh, but while we don't know enough, we still want to predict subcellular localization, and for that the simple, we are, are going to come up with a very simple method that predicts subcellular localization, let's say in a simple classification nuclear cytoplasmic extracellular. How would you predict subcellular localization? In the simplest way. What feature would you use? So, so you use some machine learning device, you have 15,000 proteins or whatever the number is today of known subcellular localization. Um, how would you predict it de novo, sequence based? What would you use? So I'm, I'm not asking SVM versus neural network, that, that is not my question. Yeah. What composition of what? Well, uh, depending what amino acid composition. That, in fact, is exactly what the first method was. Uh, Kenta Nakai and Kanesha published that in 88. Uh, the first one was really, relatively simple. A later version here with Paul Horton on it. P-sort is one of the most frequently used methods today to make subset localization and sort of combined simple rules with machine learning and does exactly that. So P-sort finds motifs first if it doesn't find motifs, it applies exactly something like this. And therefore, yes, indeed, the amino acid composition, so what fraction of a protein is alanine or, uh, or these are residues, uh, relates to subcellular localization. How much sense does that, does that make to you? Well, it's true, okay. Uh, but is there, is there something that, why, why, why could it be the case? Why could the amino acid composition correlate with subcellular localization? Well, because the protein is never found singularly, but uh, in a certain, at a certain expression level, and if you need a whole lot of proteins that are uh, composed of the same amino acids, you will need a lot of those amino acids. No, but we're not asking, uh, can we distinguish through machine learning techniques that use amino acid composition with the fraction of the exposure, uh, the, how, how much protein you have. We are asking where the protein is. Yes, but if we have it in a, in a compartment and it needs a certain amino acid or like uh, a certain uh, ratio of a certain amino acid. Why would it you need a certain amino acid ratio? That's my question. Well, polarity. Polarity, what do you mean? Well, depending on the localization, we have different environments which are favoring different ionic uh, composition. Exactly. Okay. So, then, so sorry for the, for the quality, it's an old slide from 98. Uh, Ike vector decomposition. So, this essentially is the amino acid composition, the vector for the amino acid composition is the two first eigenvectors so that distinguish best between these three data points that I have. Green nuclear, blue extracellular, red here is cytoplasmic. And you somehow see that they are distinguished. 
and this is exactly so what you're saying so there is a signal and the signal is not not very very good but it's good to make a statistical statement that most it's most of the time is right okay what is the dent in the picture so your idea is you have a different environment right and the different environment you if you have a different amino acid composition you fit better to a different environment so my question to you what of the protein sees the environment The surface, right? So if we plot now the core, if we plot now the correlation for the residues inside, we would expect to lose this correlation. And that's exactly what we see. Uh, again, I'm sorry for the quality, but you now do not take my word for it. Uh, so there's still some distinction here. There are still some extreme green points out here, but then there are already some green points out here. And blue points are already nowhere in their own cloud. Uh, so a three-state prediction no longer looks, looks very, very promising. In fact, look at the alternative way of looking at it. That's now the surface. On the surface, this green here, blue and red, is much better than this. So the signal is here, not here. Yes, Benjamin? Uh, I have a question, and that is if we would have uh, an amino acid chain that we have somehow sequenced, um, and we wouldn't know the structure of the protein, but the, the cellular localization of it could be then deduced from the cellular localization, the surface, uh, ah. and then so how do I get subcellular localization? So subcellular localization have uh, solvent accessibility. You have to, to predict the surface. And what I do not show you here, is, what, so far I'm only showing you that the signal really sits on the surface. You are asking the next question: How do I get my finger on the surface? Mm -hmm. Let's let's not do that at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But what if my uh, subcellular compartments don't have a difference in charge? So we can only distinguish between things that actually have. Those charge. three already have. Okay. But we had five, I think, for the. In those five, you can do two. Uh, so it gets more complicated at some point. You're right, and there's a limit to this. I'm only we are, we're talking about the simp most simplistic approach, and I'm sh showing you that most simplistic approach essentially works by picking up. So you can refine that. Uh, so it makes a lot of sense. This is all I'm saying. And here's another neat thing, a neat feature. Uh, this is a larger data set. Uh, again, the extracellular blue, cytoplasmic uh, red nuclear and green. What you see is here are some examples where the blue is in the area of the red. And Miguel Andrade, who, who did this work, uh, found that the ones were, that were right in the wrong area were those that were where sugar were, was put on. So meaning you change your surface by simply putting a molecule of sugar in and then you can sort of mimic a surface. You are an extracellular protein, put a sugar on and you look, your surface is completely compatible with the cytoplasmic surface. And this in fact is an immediate mechanism by which you can imagine that you're happy as a traveler. Just put the sugar on and then you're, you're, you're happy in that environment. And where in fact you can also sort of mimic different environments. And for these examples, the, so all the outliers, he, those days, it was simple in 98, uh, he, I believe he looked at the complete set of outliers and, and they were all somehow uh, post-translationally modified with sugars or other molecules. Uh, neat mechanism. Overall, anyway, the height of the letter here re, uh, relates to how often you find that in a uh, particular class, and you do see that the, the letter heights differ. Okay, these three subcellular localizations clearly differ. Uh, so then there's this issue of predicting subcellular localization, uh, solvent accessibility. So can you predict that this D and C here in the protein are not accessible to water, uh, or slightly accessible to water, but C clearly is not, uh, versus A, B, G, F, E, who are, that are accessible to water. There's a machine learning device that predicts solvent accessibility and reaches sort of 75% accuracy. Uh, and with this, you can essentially predict uh, this surface relatively well. 
And here's another insert. You can use this. Uh, so one of the most successful tool is conserve and consec. Uh, conserve. Essentially, all it does is a tool from the group of uh, Nirbental, uh, Fabien Glasser. Uh, um, that simply measures how you look at a surface or a molecule in 3D, a structure, and you overlay what is the sequence conservation of the family. And by the, looking at the ones that are completely conserved on the surface, typically on the surface residues are not conserved. When you're conserved on the surface, you may expect that there's binding going on and you exactly see the binding site. So this is what Conserve allows it to do. And CONSEC does sort of the same thing without knowing the 3D structure predicting solvent accessibility. Yes, Anton. Uh, I have a question about um, an approach. Of, let's say we have uh, a lab working with us. And mm -hmm. the lab asks, we have the option to analyze the localization of proteins mm -hmm. 10 things at a time. Mm -hmm. So by, I don't know, labeling with GFP. Mm -hmm. Could we then use an in silico approach to identify the proteins which we don't know the localizations of, but if we did, we could infer a lot more. So which are the most interesting proteins to actually get these? Do you mean by homology-based modeling or by, by the GFP data? I'm not entirely sure what you're asking. Yeah, the GFP data is just the ones, it's just the method. Okay, so that's only to, to create whatever data set you have. Yes, exactly. So uh, what do we want to know? What, what would be the most important things to find out? Uh, let me table this, this question for two minutes. Uh, this brings us to the novel prediction of subset localization, and that will be next Tuesday. <laughs>